the Red-Throated League of the Norwegian Explorers. The Sherlock Holmes collection holds the original radio scripts that Edith Meiser wrote for the program Sherlock Holmes. The Red-Throated League of the Norwegian Explorers has been dramatizing at least one Edith Meiser script annually since 1995. Under the direction of Robert Brusick, the League has performed at the Pavik Museum of Broadcasting in St. Louis Park and also at a number of our triannual conferences. Today, sit back and relax as we go back into February 28, 1944, that's 1944, when the nation huddled around their radios to listen to the Red Throated League perform the Missing Bullion. In a few minutes, the tunnel where you and Dr. Watson are treading water will be filled. So I'm afraid we won't meet again. Goodbye, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Before we, we begin tonight's exciting adventure with Sherlock Holmes, let us hear a word from the first of our sponsors. By the way, each advertisement draws upon the persona of Sherlock Holmes and may be found in various magazines. Elementary, my dear Watson, I never thought of that is the first reaction of many people when we mention that Lloyd's Bank traveler's checks are just as useful here at home as they are abroad. Yet it does not take a Sherlock Holmes to perceive the similarity of the two cases. It is very convenient anywhere to pay one's way by traveler's checks, hotel bills, rail tickets, air or boat passages, and even more so to be able to refill one's note case judiciously from time to time instead of cramming it from the outset with highly transferable wealth. Lloyd's Bank traveler's checks can be cashed at the branches of most British banks and are widely accepted throughout Britain and the United States by many other agents. The security and consequent ease of mind they provide are invaluable. Lloyd's Bank Traveler's Checks. Once again, it is time for us to stretch our legs in front of Dr. Watson's hospitable hearth. Outside, there's a blizzard, half snow, Half sleep. Oh, let's hope it's the last for the season. <laughs> right. Small particles of ice beat a delicate tattoo against the window pane. A not unpleasant sound. If you're safe inside, in front of your own fire, uh, with a glass in one hand and... And uh, a Sherlock Holmes adventure to look forward to. Yes, I was coming to that, Mr. Hartman, but don't rush me. Mm, yes, let me see. Last time... I seem to remember promising you another story concerning... Professor Moriarty, Holmes' arch-enemy, the notorious Napoleon of crime who had all London in his sinister grasp. Until Holmes came along, and even then it was touch and go as to who would come out on top. Yet let me see, uh, this particular case, the, the one I have in mind, began late one stormy afternoon. Uh, the rain streaked obliquely down the Baker Street windows, obliterating the world outside. Inside, a fire crackled on the hearth. Well, I'll admit, I was half dozing in my armchair 
Holmes had been bending for a long time over a low-power microscope. Suddenly, he straightened up and looked round at me in triumph. It is glue, Watson. <sighs> oh, did you say something, Holmes? I said it's unquestionably glue. Here, have a look at these scattered particles. Well, I'll, I'll take your word for it. Yes. The hairs under this microscope are threads from a tweed coat. The irregular gray masses are dust. There are epithelial scales on the left. You, uh, you don't say. And those blobs in the center are undoubtedly glue. Does anything vital depend on that? Only a man's life, Watson. The accused man in the St. Pancras case is a picture maker who habitually handles glue. These particles under the microscope should hang him. Uh, picture frame maker. Uh, disappointing. Uh, you see, I was hoping that some way, something would, uh, would lead us to another bout with uh, <clears throat> Professor Moriarty. Who knows? Maybe it will. Moriarty is the organizer of crime not the perpetrator. This little picture frame maker may well be one of his henchmen. Yes, Moriarty sits motionless like a spider in the center of a web of murder, treachery, and crime that covers all of London. This web has a thousand radiations and Moriarty knows every quiver of each one of them. He does little himself, he only plans. But his agents are numerous and splendidly organized. Is there a crime to be done, a paper to be abstracted, a house to be rifled, a man to be removed? The word is passed on to the professor. The matter is organized and carried out. As in the case of the picture framer, the agent may be caught, in which case money is found for his bail or defense. It's a shocking state of affairs. But the central power which utilizes the agent is never caught, never so much as suspected, confounded. Oh, don't be so downhearted, Holmes. You, you have to admit that since your last tussle with Professor Moriarty, the amount of crime in London has uh, well, noticeably decreased. I, I wonder well, what... perhaps uh, we've even discouraged the fellow. Who knows? I started to say, I wonder what he's up to now. Any diminishing of Professor Moriarty's activities, Watson, does not mean he's reformed. It only indicates that a master coup, an important scheme, is in the making. Yes, I feel fairly easy in my mind when there is this usual list of petty thievery, counterfeiting, and even physical assault. It's when there's a marked falling off in these ordinary crimes that we must deduce that Moriarty's organization has its energies devoted to bigger game. Yes, but what do they be up to now? If only we had some clue, some slight indication we might be able to forestall some major catastrophe. Well, I, I, I wish we could at least discover what the man looked like. For all we know of him, we could pass him on the street and, and never be the wiser. Yes, that is where he has the advantage over us, Watson. Unfortunately, the reputation and features of Sherlock Holmes have become public property in the last few years. Except when you disguise yourself, of course. One can't go about perpetually disguised. Yes, as you say, we could pass him in the street, and probably do nearly every day, and yet not have the slightest inkling as to whether the man is tall, short, cadaverous, or uh, given to your more ample proportion. Oh, now, Holmes, just because you haven't sufficient flesh on your bones to, uh, uh, you know, uh... Oh, at last, that will be my client. He's exactly 17 and a half minutes late for his appointment. I didn't know you were expecting someone, Holmes. Yes. His case must be fairly urgent to bring him out in weather like this. Unless, of course, he sent around a messenger 
to cancel his appointment. No, no, here's Mrs. Hudson step on the stair. The gentleman himself has arrived. <laughs> so it's a, it's a personage. Uh, Mrs. Hudson only announces our important visitors. Uh, the riffraff can scamper up the stairs by themselves. <laughs> come in, come in. A Lord Bretherton to see you, sir. He said he's got an appointment. Quite. Show him up, Mrs. Hudson. Uh, yes, sir. And you might tell his lordship to remove his galoshes before he goes mucking up any more carpet. I'll use my influence, Mrs. Hudson. Yes, sir. You can come up, sir. Bretherton. Bretherton Holmes, you might have warned me that you were expecting the head of the Bank of England, so I could have at least changed into a proper jacket. I don't imagine the governor of the Bank of England is interested in your sartorial status, Watson. After all, he's here primarily to consult with me. Mr. Holmes, Mr. Holmes, you must help us. The financial stability of England is being undermined. If you can't solve the mystery, all Europe will be ruined. You see, Watson, what did I tell you? Sit down, Lord Bretherton, here by the fire. And please remove your wet galoshes as our landlady requests. <clears throat> Allow me to take your overcoat, uh, Lord Bretherton. <laughs> by the way, this is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. Uh, how do you do? How do you do? Inasmuch as you mention a financial debacle, Lord Bretherton, I gather you're here in your official capacity as Governor of the Bank of England. That's right, Mr. Holmes. Our reserve, our gold reserve, is disappearing. As you probably know, we have the largest gold reserve in the world, hidden away in our vaults. The entire financial structure of the empire is based on it. And yet, it is disappearing at the rate of nearly 50,000 pounds a night. Great Scott! Don't you keep it locked up? Locked up? Good Lord, man! The Bank of England has the most impregnable vaults in the empire. You mean had? Mm, well, yes. I tell you, it's fantastic. There's an armed guard stationed outside the entrance to these vaults every night. Ha, he's been bribed. The guard is a group of six men, ordinarily. Lately, it's been augmented to ten. All of them trusted employees of the bank. You couldn't possibly bribe that many. No, I think we can dismiss the possibility of bribery. Besides... None of these guards has the combination to the great safe. So, you think the safe has been tampered with? I do not. When I arrive in the morning, nothing has been tampered with. Absolutely nothing. And yet, part of the bullion is missing. It's melting away like snow in a spring thaw. It's fantastic. Utterly impossible. And yet it happens. Night... After night, after night. Hmm. Yes, this has all the earmarks of one of the professor's projects. No wonder his other activities have been lying dormant. 50,000 pounds a night. Quite a haul, even for Professor Moriarty. Professor Moriarty, who's he? He wields more power for evil than any man in England. Uh, never heard of him. Therein lies most of his effectiveness. Even Scotland Yard is just beginning to realize that he's not a myth. Yes, only Professor Moriarty could pull off a scheme to rob the impregnable Bank of England. I rather imagine he enjoys it. Mm, but how, how can we find out how he does it? There's not a hint, not even a clue. In this case, I think we may dispense with deduction and revert to the more direct method. Uh, what do you mean? With your permission, Watson and I will spend the night in the vaults themselves. In that way, we should be able to observe how the theft is accomplished. Mm, but isn't that dangerous? <laughs> Undoubtedly. Well, yes. If we're lucky, we may even meet the great Moriarty face to face, though. Where's my cap and ulster? 
And I'd better bring my Elise number two. <laughs> I fancy an extra sweater and a muffler will be more useful, Watson. The vaults of the Bank of England will hardly have central heating. Come in. Will you be having company to supper, Mr. Holmes? Uh, no, Mrs. Hudson. I'm afraid Dr. Watson and I won't be here ourselves. Come on, Watson. After you, Lord Bretherton. You might have let me know before I cooked me leg of mutton. Uh, sorry, Mrs. Hudson, but we have an urgent engagement to dress some missing bullion. We'll have the mutton for breakfast, if we're back in time. Bullion? And he won't even touch soup at home. If we don't locate this bullion, Mrs. Hudson, the nation will be in the soup. Touched. <laughs> Touched. That's what he is sometimes. Plain touched. This is my office, gentlemen. Oh, quite an impressive setup, eh, Holmes? The entrance to the Great Vault is, is here, behind this paneling. Wait, there's a secret door. We push this finial, so. I, I must say I'm disappointed, Lord Bretherton. I always thought vaults were underground. Mm. This one is no exception, Dr. Watson. This is merely the passageway that leads to the vault. If you pardon me, I'll ring for my two assistants. You see, it takes all three of us to open the door to the vault. A very wise precaution, I'm sure. Yes, but dashed inconvenient sometimes. Mm, come on in. Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson, may I present my associates? Mr. Jones and Mr. Knox. Oh, how, how do you do? How do, you, do? Uh, you see, Mr. Holmes, that even for this upper door, no one man knows the entire combination. It is divided into three parts, between no jo Jones, Knox, and myself. Jones begins the job. Pardon me, sir. And now, Knox. And I complete the effort. No one else knows the combination? It's not filed away by the Prime Minister or some high official? No, Mr. Holmes. If by any chance anything should happen to any one of us three, this door would have to be blasted open. Hmm, yes, a proper precaution. Uh, but dashed unhandy, I should think, yes. We, we cannot be too cautious where the gold reserve of England is concerned, Dr. Watson. Now, I will pull this iron door open. Be careful. It swings out. Steps leading down into Stygian darkness. Yes, we shall need a lantern. There's a lantern hanging here on the back of the door, sir. We shall need two lanterns. One which can be left in the vault with Dr. Watson and myself, and one to light your return trip. There's another halfway down the tunnel. We can detach that as we go along. Splendid. If you will take this first lantern, Lord Bretherton, and lead the way. Very well. Jones and Knox can bring up the rear. Watch your step, gentlemen. Stretches on forever, doesn't it? Not quite forever, I imagine. The blackness ahead tends to elongate the vista. Mr. Holmes, you're about to view one of the great secrets of the British Empire. 
Only a few persons know that this vault even exists. When it was constructed just a few years ago, the whole affair was conducted with the utmost secrecy. Uh, but the workmen, uh, there must have been oh, dozens of them. Uh, the laborers who, who made the excavations, you'll notice that this tunnel has been blasted out of solid rock. Those workmen were imported especially from Hungary. They have long since been shipped back to their homes. What about the men that finished the job? They were a hand-picked few, each and every one completely trustworthy. And no one man was employed by the whole structure. Each one only stood, understood his portion of the job. This, uh, <clears throat> this, uh, this vault, uh, couldn't someone bore into it from the other side or from the bottom? Impossible. This tunnel is the only way of access to the vault. The whole thing has been built to withstand assault, bombardment, dynamite, and flood. And yet, Professor Moriarty seems to go in and out as easily as if he were in his own home. Uh, th that's what makes it so exasperating. It can't possibly happen, but it does. The strong room itself rests on a six-foot bed of solid concrete, which has been reinforced with specially hardened steel rock. Over this, there's a layer of wedded, welded steel. Furthermore, there is an alarm system to so sensitive that if a steel, that steel casing were so much as touched from the outside, the alarm bells all over the bank would ring. Then the professor must enter from this corridor, through the vault door itself. Uh, that is the most impossible possibility of all. The entrance to the vault is a steel door weighing nearly well, 25 tons. Even knowing the mechanism that works it, it takes all three of us to oh, swing it open. Holmes, the, the tunnel, it's beginning to slant downwards. Yes, it, it's, it's rather steep in places. Do, do, you, do you feel a curious, oppressive ringing in your ears as if the atmospheric pressure has, has suddenly increased? Hmm, yes. Uh, according to my calculations, we are now under the River Thames. Great Scott! This is the last and most important safeguard of the entire system. This tunnel can be flooded in three minutes. The water can be turned on only by telegraphic system from three separate points. One in the bank, one in the office of the Prime Minister, and one ten miles out in the country. You see, even in case of war, the nation's treasure is safe. Yes, safe from everyone and everything, except Professor Moriarty. I wonder how he does it. Uh, if you ask me, he must be in league with the devil. Good Lord, what's that ringing? Oh, uh, don't be alarmed. We have merely set off one of the alarms in the floor. Anyone approaching the vault cannot fail to set them off. And this, gentlemen, is the great strong room of the Bank of England. Tremendous, eh, Holmes? And the vaulted ceiling like a crypt. The idea that there's a river flowing directly overhead uh, doesn't add to the festivity of this place. Is that the gold piled over there, Lord Bretherton? That's it. It's in bars, you know, stacked under those canvas covers. I had no idea that the wealth of a nation could look so uh, ghostly. This, this one feeble little lantern makes everything Doubly depressing. There are lamps at intervals about the wall, Mr. Holmes. Would you care to have them lit? And give the professor warning that we're waiting for him? He'd never show up. On second thought, that might not be such a bad idea. Another thing, Mr. Holmes. You notice um, these two devices built here in the wall? They're speaking tubes. 
And if you press down this little lever, you can talk to me in my office. If you press down this lever, I shall be able to answer you. Splendid. I'll have Dr. Watson buzz you every half hour to report. If you don't hear from us, you'll know something is wrong. Hmm. Is there anything else uh, you require? Uh, no, thank you. You'd better leave now and turn the combination as you go, just as you do every night. Couldn't, uh, uh, couldn't we all just sit here and wait just as well, uh, you know, with the door open? Watson, if we're going to discover how Professor Moriarty manages to make off with the nation's gold reserve, we're not going to leave the door open to help him along. Well, yes, I, I see your point. Uh, but, but, Mr. Holmes, uh, the door is equipped with a time lock. Once it is set and closed, it cannot be opened until six o'clock tomorrow morning. Holmes, uh, you, you don't think we might suffocate down here? Uh, certainly not, Watson. The place is as big as a house. Lock the door, Lord Bretherton. And let us begin our vigil. Very well, Mr. Holmes. Um, I, I do hope the risk would prove... Uh... Don't be alarmed. If the professor pays us a visit, Dr. Watson is armed. He can handle him. <laughs> Thank you for the, vo for the vote of confidence. <laughs> uh, what are you doing now? Um, setting the time lock. There, there, it's, it's finished. Come, gentlemen. We will leave Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson to protect the nation's gold. Good night, Mr. Holmes, and, and good luck. Good night, gentlemen, and stay safe. <laughs> Sounds fatalistic, doesn't it, Holmes? I'm going to cover the lantern. We'd better wait in the dark. Good Lord, what's that? Calm yourself, Watson. That's the governor and his satellites marching back along the passageway. They've set off the alarm. Well, here we sit, all alone until hmm, six o'clock tomorrow morning. You mean you hope we'll be all alone? Hmm, my watch says four o'clock. Time to report to the governor again, Watson. <sighs> what did you say? Report to the governor. <sighs> I, must have, I must have dozed off. Uh, yes, solid gold may have its uses, but mm, it makes a dashed uncomfortable bed. Holmes. What? Uh, don't you think it's getting rather stuffy down here? Nonsense. Plenty of air. And we've only two more hours to go. Two hours? I feel as if we've spent a lifetime down here. And with no results, confound it. You, uh, you don't suppose Professor Moriarty got wind of the fact that we're, well, that we're waiting for him? It's quite possible. Yes, well, I'd better ring Lord Bretherton again before he starts worrying about us. Let, let's see. Pull down this thingamabob. Are you there, Dr. Watson? How are things going? So, so far, nothing has happened, Lord Bretherton. Everything's as quiet and peaceful as the tomb. Now, that's an unfortunate simile, Holmes. <laughs> but I wish, I wish we'd had some water or something. This, this stuffy air makes a fellow infernally mm, dry, but I think we can hold out till six. No signs of anything wrong? Not a sign, not a thing. It looks like the whole thing is a false alarm. Uh, buzz you again at 4.30. Very well. Oh, I wish I hadn't mentioned water. My mouth is dry, positively dusty. Oh, now what's that? It's the bell to the speaking tube. Lord Bretherton must be calling back. Yes, Lord Bretherton? Good evening, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Oh, should I say good morning? Hello, you have a message. about to grant your wish. You see, 
I couldn't help overhearing your conversation with the estimable governor, in which you expressed a desire for water. Well, Dr. Watson, you shall have water. All the water you can possibly desire. Uh, what do you mean? I have just opened the floodgates which the bank so thoughtfully provided. You, you can't do that. It's just a bluff. No. You hear my voice, do you not? I am able to remove the gold from the vaults. Then why would it be too difficult for me to open the floodgates? You see, I had the laborers who built the vault construct me a connection with this little speaking tube. Very interesting. So you bribed them to put in an extra connection for the floodgates and one or two other little innovations which enabled you to have access to the gold. Ingenious. Very. You still haven't guessed how the trick is done, eh, Mr. Holmes? Too bad you won't be able to figure it out. Oh, I grant you could do it in time, but time is just what you won't have. Listen. Yes, that is the sound of water rushing into the corridor outside the vault. In another 15 minutes, it will be quite full. Very interesting, but not particularly agitating, Professor Moriarty. You know, of course, that this vault is watertight. I've only to communicate with Lord Bretherton to have it drained off. That would be quite possible, except for two factors. In the first place, it will take at least a week to drain the tunnel once it is filled. By that time, you will have died of hunger or thirst or suffocation. And in the second place, I am now destroying this system of communication. Yes, I am afraid we won't meet again. Goodbye, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> <laughs> What a, uh, Holmes, what in blazes? There goes our communication. You, you mean it's impossible to get word out to Lord Bretherton? If he has any intelligence, he knows the entire situation by now. I pressed down the lever on the other tube while the professor was talking. He must have heard what he said. Well, in that case, uh, we're all right. He'll turn off the water. There must be a way to do that. No, the water is still rushing in. I imagine Professor Moriarty destroyed the mechanism that controlled that as well. I only hope they have the sense not to waste time on us, but to search the bank for Professor Moriarty. He must be somewhere on the premises, or, or he couldn't cut in on the speaking tube. If only I were up there. Confound it, they have him trapped. If only the... Holmes, my foot, it feels damp. Yes, turn, turn the lantern this way. Oh, good Lord, the water is seeping all around the door. But that's impossible. Here, see for yourself, it's coming. Faster and faster. We'll be drowned like <laughs> rats in a trap. Interesting. Very interesting indeed. Holmes, how can you stand there so calm? Don't you realize what's happening? Look. The water is literally pouring in. The crack is widening. So I see. Well, the water, it's like ice. It's up around my ankles already. Then climb up on this pile of gold bars. We may as well stay out of it as long as possible. Funny, funny, you know, the gold would mean so much to the average person, but to us, it's just a means to keep our feet dry. Yes, the pressure outside must be tremendous. It must be terrific if it can burst cracks in a 25-ton steel door. It's not the door that's giving way, Watson. It's the outside of the steel door frame. Of course. Of course. Why didn't I realize it before? Realize what? What? Are you so excited about, Holmes? That's how he did it. Of course, that's how he was able to get in. What a fool I was not to realize it before. And what are you raving about? The steel door. 
It's geared to lock itself into this steel frame so that nothing short of an earthquake could break it open. But the frame, Watson, what if the frame itself can be swung open? By Jove, that's an idea. That must be the solution. Otherwise, the water would not be able to force open that crack. Hurry, Watson. We must find the way to open it. Lord, yes. It must open quite easily. Otherwise, the professor couldn't manage. If only we can find the method before it's too late. The corridor must be over half full by now. No. No. N nothing on this side of the door. We must find it. Try the other side. I, I think I've got it. Isn't this a concealed bolt? Let's see. Yes. Help me to slip it, Watson. Easy now. If only the door swings in. If it doesn't, we haven't a chance of opening it against the pressure of the water in the corridor outside. Well, what if we're too late? What if the corridor is full already? We'll have to take the chance. It can't be any worse than the fix we're in now. I'm pulling out the bolt. Hang on to me, Watson. Uh, yes, yes, it's swinging open. Watson, where are you? Here. I can't stand up. The current is too strong. Yes, you can. Here, hold on to me. Come on, Watson. We'll live to beat Professor Moriarty at his own game yet. I take it you did manage to get through that tunnel of water, Dr. Watson. Yeah, well, <laughs> yes, we did, Mr. Hartman. <laughs> Ooh, we did. Uh, once or twice, it looked pretty hopeless, but we managed. And Professor Moriarty, did they catch him? No, unfortunately. The officers of the bank were too concerned with our welfare. Uh, by the time they searched the premises, the bird had flown the coop. <laughs> well, they did find an interesting little hideaway up in the attic, however, uh, with a rather complete collection of devices and mechanisms of all sorts. Quite ingenious, some of them. Holmes had a lovely time dismantling them. Well, you, I stayed in bed recuperating from, from a heavy cold. <laughs> My goodness, those were deep waters indeed. Well, <laughs> while Dr. Watson recovers from his cold and his dreadful experience in that vault and that bank vault, let's hear a word from another of our sponsors, the tale of Sherlock Holmes and the sleepless watchman. My dear Watson, said Sherlock Holmes suddenly, what do you make of this? Handing me a bronze door plate with a small clock set in the face of it? A simple thing, he said and yet, at the same time, one which, when it is universally used, will, I'll wager, put Lestrade, stupid as he is, on a par with the best of us. This mechanism will do more to prevent crime than you and I and Scotland Yard combined. In the first place, every time a key is inserted in the lock, it prints a record. It tells if the bolt was locked or unlocked, and what is more, it records the exact time of each operation and tells who is the operator. It also tells if your place was entered between closing and opening time and by whom. No doubt you will remember the League of the Red-Headed Men. This lock would have saved our hard-headed friend a lot had he had it at the time. This lock is a watchman that is always alert, unerringly correct, and that you cannot bribe. Rather remarkable, don't you think, Watson, this sleepless lock? Can you afford to be without this lock that will tell you who opened your door and when, and who closed it and when? It only costs a cent a day for such a record. Can you afford to be without it? The Sleepless Watchman is the title of our book which tells all about it and which we will be pleased to send you upon request. Columbus Recording Lock Company, 
Box 743, St. Paul, Minnesota. That's all we have time for this evening. We bid farewell to Dr. Watson and Sherlock Holmes until next time. That is something you can bank on. This is Paul Hartman wishing you good night. <laughs>